So I was raised in a commune in the woods of Southern Oregon. For most of my life, I didn't like to talk about it much. If you were coming to age in the 60s, you know exactly what a commune is. It's a place where people would live together, they would share the work, and they would share their material possessions. That's not to say that everybody was equal in our commune. In fact, my family was unofficially second class. But the rules for advancement were always shifting such that we never really felt stable. There was collaboration for sure, but there was a lot of competition and a lot of manipulation. I remember when I was a teenager, I got into a heated argument with a good friend of mine, and I ended up an agenda topic for an upcoming meeting of all the adults. And so being somewhat resourceful, I found this hidden location where I could listen in on the meeting without being detected. And I wish I hadn't. Because I heard myself labeled as a troublemaker, as a button pusher. And I burned with anger because I felt those judgments about my character weren't being shared to lift me up. They were being shared to keep me in my place. And it was that moment and, and moments like it along the way that caused me to make a promise to myself. Give me time and give me a fair shot and I'll prove that I can be successful. You know, we all get launched into life from somewhere. I got launched from a commune, a bit of a chip on my shoulder, something to prove. My parents decided to take the family out of the commune. I graduated high school and I quickly started making life decisions that would make a life planner absolutely cringe. I married my high school sweetheart when I was but a teenager. I decided I was going to skip college altogether. I joined a circus. Not really, I didn't. <laughs> but I did join an undercapitalized family startup business, which was a lot like a circus. We were some of the first people to build tall communication towers to make the cellular networks work. I used to climb those. It was the wide open wild west. We were building our business. In a lot of ways, having left the commune, we were building a new life. And I loved it. I fell in love with the entrepreneur lifestyle. The business grew. I had a chance to become an owner, and we expanded up and down the West Coast. And before long, we were fortunate to receive an offer to sell our company. And so with my lawyer, with my dad, we traveled to Philadelphia. And we met in the prestigious law offices of the acquiring firm. And that day, we signed papers. That's my dad on the right. I'm the one with the puffy shoulders on the left and that, that coat from the 90s. <laughs> and I flew home at 27 years old, worth more money than I ever thought I'd see. Suddenly, life was pretty good. Bought that sports car I'd always dreamt about, joined the country club, built a house in the nicest part of town. All the markers of success were falling into place. Have you ever achieved a major life goal? The kind you chase every day. What did that feel like for you when you won? I bet it was amazing. How long did that feeling last? And what did you do next? You see, many of us are like the proverbial dog chasing the car. We have no idea what's going to happen after we actually sink our teeth into the tire. I remember coming across an article where I discovered a phrase, sudden wealth syndrome. And I remember one quote from that article. A tech executive had struck it rich. He said, having more money just allowed me to make bigger mistakes. And when I heard that, I was living those mistakes. And I was feeling the pain of this thump, thump, thump of having caught that car with no plan. You see, I'd fancied myself an investor, so I invested in a technology company in Florida, and a services company in California, and a cellular license in the populous state of Montana, and restaurants throughout Oregon, and they all had one thing in common. I lost every single penny in every single one of them. And along the way, I'd cultivated a bit of a taste for life in the fast lane. So more travel, less accountability and structure, more opportunity for choices that would compromise my values and undermine my confidence. You see, many people can pass the test of adversity, 
but a better test of our character to see how we handle the test of success. Losing the money was painful. Losing my self-respect, that was much worse. I was disappointed. I was embarrassed. And perhaps I was humbled enough. I started asking myself better questions, like what's really motivating you? And how had I screwed things up so badly, so quickly? And my life changed when I got that answer. I finally knew what was wrong with me. I hadn't been grateful. I was many things. I was determined. I was driven. I was ambitious. But I was not grateful. See, gratitude is acknowledging a gift received. Like that dog chasing the car, I was doing exactly what came naturally. But for many of us, particularly driven personality types, gratitude doesn't come naturally. Ambitious people struggle to feel satisfaction for two reasons that I've seen. First, we are so forward focused on that next challenge and that next opportunity, we never stop to value what we've been given and appreciate where we've come from. And why would we protect what we don't value? Second, we believe the path to satisfaction is through achievement. But satisfaction doesn't live on the other side of achievement. Satisfaction lives on the other side of gratitude. We all want essentially the same thing, contentment, fulfillment, peace. But the promise of peace for most of us is this mythical place we rarely get to visit and we never get to live. I figured out my default temperament is triple A. Almost always anxious. I had to admit I was often motivated by envy of what other people had and what other people were achieving, even though I'd been given so much. And I've learned to use gratitude as this powerful antidote to battle these negative emotions that would flood over me. And what I discovered is that when I filter my feelings with gratitude, gratitude actually changes those feelings. And I call this entire reorientation process of my thinking a gratitude adjustment. I'm going to share with you portions of the gratitude adjustment that's meant the most to me over the last decade. Now, I do this in the shower because several reasons. First, I need a shower every day, and I need gratitude every day. But also, I know that I'm not going to get distracted. So here's what I do. I think about God, and I think about the beauty and the wonder of this natural world. And I just express thanks for whatever comes to mind. It could be the colors of a sunset at the Oregon coast, or a changing of the seasons in the West, the diversity of people and cultures. I express thanks for things I understand and for things I don't understand. And, and I take a step back, and I remind myself, I had nothing to do with any of that. You see, it's really important for me to remember, I'm not holding this all together. That helps me think about forgiveness, accepting forgiveness, extending forgiveness to people who I think might have wronged me in the past, forgiving myself. You know, it's impossible to feel grateful and hateful at the same time. If you don't believe that, go try it at home. And I like to finish my exercise by thinking through what I call my domains, the areas where I've been given influence as a father to four children, as a husband to my high school sweetheart, as a mentor, as an author, as a business owner, as an American. And I express thanks for the privilege of serving in each of those areas. And whether that exercise takes me two minutes or 10 minutes, if I open up my heart and I get past the noise in my head without fail, by the time I leave that shower, my emotional outlook is completely changed. You see, gratitude changes everything because it works like a lens through which we see 
everything else. Cicero has said, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. Dr. Sonia Lubomirsky is an expert in the field of positive psychology. She's a professor of psychology at UC Riverside. She earned her uh, undergrad from Harvard, her PhD from Stanford. She and her colleagues have done thousands of hours of research into what makes us happy. And she illustrates this in a concept she calls the happiness pie. You get to debate on the flavor of this pie this morning. So it turns out about 50% of what makes people happy is tied to their genetics. We each get a set point based on our DNA. Some people are naturally a little bit happier than others. That's where we start. They discovered this by researching identical twins who were raised in completely different environments. And what they found is despite their completely different environments, they returned to a very similar set point because of their DNA. So if 50% of what makes us happy is our DNA, what makes up the other half? You might be tempted to think, well, our circumstances. Well, not really. In fact, our circumstances only make up 10%, roughly, of what makes us happy. So money, possessions, beauty, social status, that stuff only moves the needle 10%. That's not even a good dessert. But it's worse than that. This 10% is very unstable. Sociologists look at it like a treadmill or an endless track due to something called hedonic adaptation. Let me explain what that is. Have you ever observed when something bad, even traumatic, happens in somebody's life, how over time they learn to deal with it? They cope. Well, hedonic adaptation observes that when something good, even amazing, happens to us, we learn to deal with those new circumstances as well. So if we're chasing happiness by achievement and stuff, pretty soon that emotional buzz wears off, and we are right back to chasing again. Perhaps this is why we, as a culture, spend countless hours scouring the digital pawn shop of our smartphone, <laughs> while at the same time we're ignoring the treasures we already have. But here's the happiness pie punchline that gives me so much hope. A full 40% of what makes us happy is intentional activity. It's how we think, and it's the actions that we will take in response to those thoughts. You cannot change your DNA, and by now you may agree that more stuff isn't going to do the trick either. But this 40%, you can change. This is where we do the hard work of thinking through what do we really think is important in life, and making intentional steps, taking intentional activity in that direction. There's tremendous satisfaction from making meaningful progress in an area that you feel is important. I can't tell you how that discovery process should work for you because we're all unique. But I will strongly suggest start with gratitude because gratitude gives perspective for that work. Of the top 30 character traits, the research says that gratitude uniquely predicts satisfaction with life. 10 years ago, I had an opportunity to lead another company as president of a startup. This time, I knew I had to do it differently. I wanted to lead with gratitude. The business grew. Uh, we became a leader in making smartphones work inside stadiums and subways and skyscrapers. Last year, we were fortunate to sell the business, and there I was having achieved a goal and faced with that question, what's next? You see, but gratitude had prepared me. 
had clarified what was real and what was important. Gratitude is where we discover there's abundance headed our way. It's completely disconnected from our striving. It's where we learn to take an assessment of our gifts and our resources and the opportunities we have to make a difference in the world. It's where we make that shift from being driven to being the one doing the driving. Gratitude clarified for me what's important. I know now. I want to reach for my potential. I want to impact my world. And I want to leave a legacy. But I'm not doing that out of a sense of striving and chasing. No. My motivation now is a response to what I've already been given. You see, gratitude is really just good accounting. Acknowledging a gift received. If you want more happiness, more joy, more satisfaction, start with gratitude. A gratitude adjustment changes everything.